I think that'd be great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come to church for purposes far beyond ourselves. We come to grow and to learn about what the Lord has. Um, after the financial class, the last weekend, uh, week, sorry, Monday, uh, and it'll be every Monday as the last week of the month at 6 p.m., we will be coming together to pray. And every Monday evening, last week of the month, we'll come to pray. Because we are not a church that prays for our ministry. Our ministry is birthed out of our prayer. Our prayer life is what really is what draws the focus and direction because that is our direct communication with God and his communication to us. And so I really believe we need to get to a, a, a holy habit of letting God be God and, and coming together. And so you're all invited to that. Uh, elders would meet in advance of that. And then we will have things to come together and pray for. Uh, man, there are so many things that God is doing uh, in the lives of the body, more than just the, the building of this body and the building that we uh, come to. It is amazing. Somebody, the police are here? Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. And has her notes open now? <laughs> and this is a message of warning. So <laughs> you can put that one down. <laughs> you know, as I look at scripture today, would you pray with me today? Spirit of God, we've come today, Lord. You've drawn us this far into your presence. Father, you have a reason and a purpose in every day. Lord, you've given us just enough time in our life to account for and to live out the purposes that you have that we would fulfill by the power of your spirit. So Lord, today, as we continue in the book of Haggai and move to this lesson that your word has to say, Lord, I, I pray that your fresh word would both be anointed and speak to our hearts. Father, take us beyond what we learn. Speak directly to us. Speak to our soul. Penetrate our heart today. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, he is holy. Tomorrow, he is holy. He's been holy. And holiness is not a word that we talk about very often or describe. The subject matter has been focused in our walk through the book of Haggai as the construction of the holy temple, but we want to move as priests in the building and the practice of that temple. So we want to understand and define what this holiness is. You know, God has rightly placed us in righteousness. And righteousness represents that we are perfectly aligned and perfectly brought into the submission under the authority of God. We could not bring ourselves to this perfect place, but God did it through his son, Jesus Christ. So righteousness is when God moves us perfectly into the alignment under the presence and power of God. And if we are willing to submit under that, then the righteousness of God is flowing in us. Not that any man boasts, but the righteousness of God is that which Christ Jesus has imprinted through the power of his spirit. The Holy Spirit, the holiness, is the pursuit under that righteous banner towards the relationship with God that perfects you and me. And I think this is a part of the lesson that we need to learn because we tend to live out our lives outside of the holiness of God. All the resources of this world distract us from the holiness of God. For centuries and eons, for millennia, the people of God, the Israelites that were a chosen people were taught through the practices of the priesthood of how to conduct themselves, how to consecrate themselves, how to distinguish between that which is holy and that which was not. And continually, mankind has disobedience in his heart and has strayed from the calling of that. We looked in Haggai throughout this last few weeks to see that this foundation had been laid. It's the foundation of salvation. They had been freed from the Babylonian captivity. They had been brought into the land of their ancestry. And they knew, even under threat, that they would need to return to the centrality of having God at the center of their worship and practice of their people. But they got discouraged. Last week, we talked about how discouragement comes in, sometimes even by threat, but discouragement, laziness, and in just that internal pressure of trying to accomplish but not seeing result can get in the way to the point that you give up hope and start focusing on the things that you can control. But God is in control. The subject matter is focused through this. We've reviewed our priorities as we exampled that Israelites, when they returned home, 
they lost their priority. We looked at the renewal of vision to restart that process of building upon the foundation. Haggai, Haggai has come in the perfect time to encourage his people. He came at the perfect time with the word of the Lord to encourage and stir up in the leaders and in the the hearts of the people to continue on the work that God has given. And I believe that that's an encouragement to you and to me today. Continue in the work that God has begun. He who is faithful will continue that work and he will bring it to completion in your life. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what struggles you have, but God has a way forward and he is the only solution. We have looked at the reasons that many have given up on the work and relationship with God as their priority. And we associate and relate to threats. We relate to fear. We relate to compromise. We relate to losing focus. We relate to discouragement. Both internal and external struggles can take us off track. Is that not true? We are going to turn our focus to that priest's responsibility. That's you and me, 1 Peter 2, 9, right? We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart. That's who we are in Christ Jesus today. And that priesthood has a conduct in which we must learn from. So let's read. As the Holy Spirit resides in that temple in us, we're gonna read Haggai 2, 11 through 15. For this is what the Lord says. Ask the priests what the law says. Here's an illustration. If someone carries consecrated meat, that which has been sanctified, in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other foods, does it become consecrated? The priest said, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Does it become contaminated? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Then Haggai, he's bringing to attention that the Lord is saying that everything that these hands of these people have touched is contaminated. We can look deeper into the law to understand that uh, the Levitical law said if you touched an unclean or a dead body, you had to go for seven days and sanctify and cleanse yourself before you could go back into the presence of God. This is an interesting illustration because what God is saying, you've left a dead temple in the middle of my place. That's what he's communicating. He says, you've reprioritized to the things that you want and yet you've left this dwelling place dead without residency. And that's the place in which I choose to dwell. So what has he done? We look through Haggai. He held up the grain. He held up the harvest. He stopped the rain. He brought about hardship in their lives. And he says, you know, you have coins in your pockets, but it feels like holes. Everything is lost to this because God is getting our attention. Is this the heart of God? Yes. Hebrews 12 says he chastens those in whom he loves. He disciplines those in whom he loves. We do go through consequence and correction and we go through it for the purpose of allowing God to be central in our focus saying, man, I might've turned and, and tried to solve this myself, but everything is just getting harder and worse. And so I turn to you, God, and I repent. And then all of a sudden, God in his divine wisdom takes what 16 years of neglect has brought. And in five weeks, he turns to a entirety of a temple built for the practice of worship again. Isn't that encouraging that we can be so far off track for so long, but yet God in a moment can turn it around. He can turn it around for you and for me. Verse 15, now give careful thought to this. From this day on, I want you to consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. Can you do that with me? Can you think about the process of what God is doing in your heart today, building upon building of stone upon stone? See, he's building a place in which his spirit desires to dwell in you and in me. But so often we neglect to hold course. We see that direct contrast between the priest's response. How does this apply to us? The priest which is us, as Revelation declares, follows in obedience what was the procedure of sacrifice and worship to God. They would consecrate or prepare meat 
by God's direct instruction and then sacrifice it on, on the altar in burnt fire. Any deviation from that plan would defile and make it impure. The meat had been made holy for sacrifice, but it doesn't carry through to all it touches. You see, uh, that which is made holy, you can't just touch that which is holy. You can't just come into church and, 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 and sprinkle on some holy water and hope that you're gonna become whole, okay? Because God has to consecrate inside of us internally into the hearts of man. We have to be willing to sacrifice. Just as I was uh, declaring Isaiah 6 today, it says, I am a man unclean with unclean lips and the seraphim, which means fire of God, the angel of the Lord took a coal and touched Isaiah's mouth because that which was consecrated and holy direct from God that came to man touched his lips and he became holy in that moment. And then he says, I'm a man undone. And God has this way of challenging our heart. I would call that true conviction. Sometimes we lose sight of conviction. And I think that we have this need to become convicted by the spirit of God. We need to become closer to the truth and repentance. You know, uh, one way of thinking about holiness is uh, an illustration is the sun. How many suns do we have in this universe? <laughs> Just one, the Milky Way, right? That we can see that's of great size that everything uh, travels around for the best of our knowledge, <laughs> according to scripture. But that sun, the closer you get to the sun, the more consumed you become, which distinguishes it all the more as holy. But nothing compares to the holiness of God. You see, the holiness of God, nothing can come to God, nothing can practice worship to God, nothing can be known uh, through God without ourselves practicing holiness to get there. The communication to God's heart is holiness. Here's the direct contrast in verse 13 shows that if we have items that are defiled, like that dead body, it contaminates all that it touches. You see, everything around us brings death, not life. This world is dying. This world for the cost of sin is dying. And yet we walk in and through a dead world and how easily we can become contaminated, immersed in the world when we choose to open the gateways and to the resources of the world instead of the resources of God. This is a direct reflection that God was pointing out that the temple was dead amongst them. A dead temple. A place that you've come and by invitation said, I believe, but yet you've never given room to perfect the work of God. Man, there's so many things we can just exchange today and give up. We can give up so many of the things that this world offers and addiction and habits. Uh, you know, I, I could even say like give up vaping and smoking, you know, and everybody gets mad. But I think if God wanted us to smoke, he'd put a chimney on our head. <laughs> but the reality is these are just things that don't, pre they prevent, they don't promote the goodness of God. But I would rather take a smoker than a gossip. I'd rather take a person that actually desires to change in their heart, that is struggling towards the change in their heart than one that hides behind how they look. You see, to be holy is to begin to exchange all things in a genuine way where what you say and what you believe, what you think and what you do are all the same. No more schizophrenia in the mind where your motive is different than your action. No more deception but rather that everything that you do is, comes true. Say, be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. Because there's nothing that God does not do. He is love, he is truth. And so we have this ability to example that truth in our life. Forgiveness. How easy is it that the contamination of sin that touches every part of our life? But the process of holiness, it's an ongoing work. It's like a battle. And it says, we're no longer at enmity with God, but rather enmity with our flesh. So quickly and so easily, we are entangled by the things of this, our flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, lust of the flesh. Those things that continue are like a bastion against the presence of God and, and the working of his work in our heart. God has given to us a, a brilliant choice and ability though, because we do not do it as a resource of our own working. We do it through the power of the Spirit of God. 
our Father took great pleasure in being able to send his spirit to us. You see, when Christ died upon the cross and he shed his blood on Calvary, it opened up the opportunity upon his resurrection for mankind to dwell again with God. You see, Christ, he came. Let's go back a little bit in history. You see this Melchizedekian order that the, the first priest's hood in the Old Testament. Then we have David, and then we have this kingship. And here we have the separation of the line of Judah is this king and this line. And over here is this priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood that follows this Melchizedek order. You know what uh, Melchizedek means? Righteous king. So we have the righteousness and kingship, but yet and that was the priesthood. That was his deliberate work. But yet man calls out for a king. And so we have this separate order. And in that separate order, the Aaronic line continues through. But then here comes Christ who is of the Melchizedek line. And he's also of the king's line of David, of Judah. And he merges back together what God intended all along. That which man has separated, let no man separate what God brings together. And what he has done is he made you a king, priest, and prophet all today. Under the, the power and presence of God, you now have unanimous in your heart all that God's authority offers. All you need to do is turn to a holy practice in your life to allow for God to be honored in this temple. Here's the warning. Turn to Ezekiel 44, 10 through 18. And I think this is where the Lord has kind of arrested my attention. I'm gonna read from verse 10. Now remember, we have a Levitical line of priests. Do anybody remember the Levitical line of priests by the name of Eli under the Aaronic line during Samuel's time when Samuel in the night said, did you call me? And he said, no. He had lost the ability to hear God. Eli had lost the ability to hear God. Uh, if you read through history, Eli was obese. He was a man corrupted in his flesh. He was a man that lost vision and sight of vision. He had become so lazy and corrupted that even the generation that would follow in his own sons, his own boys were sleeping with the women of the church and he didn't stop it but yet he continued. Zadok, we're gonna read about him. Zadok was in the time of David and the priest line that followed that would uphold the kingship and would continue to follow the charge of God through that time. So here's these two comparisons of these priestly lines that were at odds with following what God had said, verse 10. And the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. This is like Eli. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary. As gatekeepers of the house and ministers of the house, they shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. They shall stand before them to minister to them. Because they ministered to them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore I have raised my hand in an oath against them, says the Lord God they shall bear the iniquity, their own iniquity. And they shall not come near. They shall not come near to me to minister to me as priest, nor come near any of my holy things, nor into the most holy of places, but they shall bear their shame and their abomination, which they have committed. Nevertheless, I'll make them keep charge of the temple for all its work, for all that it has done to be done in it. You see, you can still be the usher. You can still be on the worship team. You can still park the cars. You can still help with the kids. But your ministry is only one to another. But because you did not keep charge, you did not represent the holiness of God in your life, you will not minister to me. But the priests, the Levites, the son of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, this temple, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. 
They shall enter my sanctuary and they shall come near my table to minister to me and they shall keep my charge. And it shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. You see that no wool because they were not to sweat. You know, the labor and sweat of the brow was the curse of man upon the account in Genesis. But they would wear linen so that no sweat would come through for they had entered into his rest in the inner courts, in the inner courts of his presence. They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes them to sweat. This is a kind of an interesting thing. It says head and linen trousers. Those trousers were kind of from the hip down to about the knee. So holy underwear. They had to wear linens. You, ever, you remember, I don't know what it was back in the day. I remember my grandma saying, put on your good underwear just in case you get in an accident. <laughs> you're like, what in the world? So you're gonna be exposed to the world. So this is kind of one of those things, right? But that, is there not an inner part of us, a, a part that is kind of hidden? You may be able to, on the outside, approach things and people see the goodness. And, you know, I don't care where you've come from. Everybody knows how to use a bar of soap and clean up a little bit. But the stains the things we've seen, the places we've been, the things we've done in our lives, those don't wash away without the blood of Christ. So when we come into this place, this holy place, when we recognize that God has made a holy place within us, that we would be ones that don't just try to wash away that which is on the outside for others to see, but we care about that which is hidden, that which is underneath, that which only God sees that that is exposed to the truth and that is which is made holy. But I go back to this, do you get it? Holiness is different than righteousness. The gift of God is righteousness. Holiness is our pursuit in relationship to him. Only holiness comes through God. You cannot find holiness in any other substance in this world, any other time in this world. In all of eternity, we have a seen and unseen realm, one reality, and there is nothing that is holy as God is holy. So the only divine resource that you have for a holy life is a relationship directly to God. We cannot build with our own hands. We cannot, that's contaminated. We cannot build stone upon stone, even as living stones being built up for a spiritual house for the Lord. As Peter says, we cannot even build that with our own hands. It has to be produced by the spirit of God's power and out of obedience to him. Such a great narrative in Ezekiel as an example. We can see as these priestly lines was actually from that line of Eli. He was corrupted in flesh but yet he still continued to practice all that he was required to do, but it was corrupt. His generations were lost, his kids were lost. They had lost respect for God. They did not revere him. Some of us talk about the fear of God, and I've heard many in ministry try to lessen what fear represents. That fear doesn't mean fear. Fear is just an awe of God, not a fear of God. I'm talking about the holy God who is an all-consuming fire. That the closer you get to him, the more that you are consumed unless that which is substance within you is holy, made holy by him. Everything else is like dross and will be gone away. Nothing of value is left except for that which he has imprinted upon your heart. I fear that God. I fear what that God can do. I fear that he can create with a word. I fear that he is seated upon the throne, never stressed about the situations, for God is sovereign in all situations, all circumstances. He remains sovereign. He remains in control. Sovereign, that he is the ruler above all. He is a God above God's. And yet, do you take the time in the morning as you start your day to give the Lord of hosts a place in your heart before you go 
and abandon him and try to live this life without him, saying that you believe in him? You see where the challenge is? How easily our mind itself can be corrupted when we try to accomplish life without him and yet to be consecrated, to actually give our lives over to the holiness of God is to be holy as he is holy, to rely upon in our worship. I wanna be a person that's up here not ministering to you, but ministering to him. Wouldn't that be a different ministry altogether? That every song that is sung, I've seen the difference, you have too. And I'll tell you, there are times, and I have always struggled with this because as you see in the practice of many churches, God does give room and season of grace and mercy. And I have seen those that are falling away, but yet the anointing still flows through them. I see the gift of God, just as Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, that which God has given will not be taken back. And so there are those that walk in gifting. There are those, he can work through anything. He's worked through a worm, he's worked through a donkey, he's worked through pretty much anything in the word of God. And so that which he uses is his hand. And those gifts do come through, but that does not in any way reference that there's character. And I have seen those who are fallen, those who are, are not uh, honoring to their wives, their spouse. You wanna know if there's a good man standing before you? Ask my wife, ask my kids. Yeah, because, thank you. You still gotta talk to her. <laughs> I don't know what she'll say. I'm just kidding. But God, he honors us by be willing to be in relationship with us. But you see, there are so many that have giftings and anointing and we see works. And I don't care what the size of their churches or how many people they draw because, you know, God can do that. That doesn't mean that the vessel is pure. It does not mean that the vessel is clean. And there are times where God's grace and in season will last, but God is still calling out to them and saying, repent, repent. Don't lose respect for what God can do in your life. Do not continue in the duties that God has given without him, without his spirit working in and through you. That's important. His spirit is the power in which we need. There is a heritage of purity. IFY, you know when it says, any word that ends in IFY, so if he purifies, it is to make pure. If he rectifies, it's to make right. And it says if he sanctifies, it's to sancti. And that's to make sainthood, but it is to make holy. That's what the words mean. So God is sanctifying his people. But that is through the process of obedience, through the filtering of the word of God, renewing the mind. Romans 12, two, therefore not confirming, uh, conforming to the world, but being transformed by the renewal of mind. Our mind is full of this world. Our mind is full of great ideas that are bad ideas because they're not God's ideas. And they can fill our mind and our heart and we can, with ambition, try to seek them out to find solutions for our life. And in the end, it leads to destruction. And he's saying, I can help you build stone upon stone in your life. I can help you to revive that which was begun by me in this work that cannot be removed. Have you ever seen a fire? Foundations don't burn. You may have to rebuild on top, but the foundation stays. And that foundation's work that's begun in you, God has started a work that can't be undone and he's asking for us, he's beckoning for us, he's begging us. He's a jealous God and he wants our attention and he wants us to allow for that which the spirit produces to begin to conform the heart, mind, and soul, our soul, mind, will, and emotion within us. He wants that to become the reality he wants that to be submitted under his authority, that righteous standing that he has given to us, perfectly aligned under the authority of God so that our mind, will, and emotions belong to him, holding captive every thought, not being deceived by our heart, letting our actions be produced by the behavior and pattern of God in us. Do you hear me this morning? Yes. Do you see what I'm saying? God has asked his people us as a holy royal priesthood, according to Revelations, we are the ones that he desires ministry from. Not ministering one to another. We can do that. We can let the spirit of God expression come out of us. We can let our gifts be used as one body, building one another up. But his desire, his heart is that our ministry flows from us first, that it comes out of us to him first. He is our priority. He is the priority of my life. He is the priority that should be stationed in your heart and life. 
God, you see, the way the temple was developed wasn't an inner court. See, all these priests are in this outer court. It's interesting if you look at how uh, things were in the historics, not something that was set by the law, but you'd have the inner holy of holies where the priests who would have to be purified to go into the actual presence of God. Outside of that is the outer court. These Jewish men would be in the outer court And then you'd have the women that would be in a a court past that. And then you'd have the Gentiles who are far distant on the outside. This is where Jesus flipped the tables, actually, is a place in which was presented for the Gentiles who were just looking in, saying, man, who is this God? And that's when that chief cornerstone, a stumbling block, came upon this earth, entered into that temple, and he said, let these people come to me. Do not suffer these little children unto me. He kept giving room for us to find our way to him. And I can prove it. You and I have received this free gift of life. You've received the free gift of grace. The foundation has been laid and you can have it imprinted upon your heart. You've been made righteous. We are perfectly positioned. So pursue God in obedience with your heart. And with your life. What is the last thing that the Spirit of God has asked of you to do? What is the last thing that he asked you to give up? What is the direction that he's asked of you to take so easily we can lose sight of our faith in him, so easily we can be overcome by fear, or sometimes we just willfully say, no, I'm gonna do it my way. Thinking that, that, that we are set free by this deliverance and invitation of the foundation that's been set, I tell you, too easily. You cannot neglect his presence. All of a sudden, we're deceived as we grow farther from him. Like I said, I don't wanna just be ministering to you. I wanna be ministering to our heavenly father so that his presence is free to minister to you and me. Let his anointing flow through. You may see success with your eyes in ministries. You may see success in your eyes with those that have money or what looks like a good marriage. I'm telling on the inside, only God knows. See, God measures by the heart. This is a season for us as a church to really begin to reflect upon what God is asking for us to do to purify ourselves, to sanctify our hearts, and to become holy as he is holy. There's not a lot in between. Very black and white. Actually, it's all light. Take into perspective what a priest was. He was a gatekeeper. It said that right in, in Ezekiel. It says he would stand and guard against the entrances and the exits. And yet they let foreign things in. They let idols in. And they were corrupt. And they let it into God's place in which he was to dwell among man in that time. Now I'll ask you with the eye gate the ear gate, the mouth. What is coming in and through your heart and life? What foreign thing are you letting in and out of you? What corrupt thing, what idol have you allowed into the place that belongs to him? It is hard to give up on the things that this world offers in entertainment. It is hard. And I'm gonna tell you, holiness is not legalism. It is not a do and don't. It is just the presence of God and you will feel the conviction. Behold, I send you a spirit and you need no man to teach you, but the spirit of God teaches you all things. He brings conviction of those things. You see, you stand before a holy God. You will be the one judged for your action. You need to listen to what he's telling you. I will not lighten the load of, well, it's okay for me. We don't look for license for uh, a sin nature. Don't feed your soul with what the world offers as nourishment. You'll die. The only thing that gives life is God. It's too easy for us to be segued over into distractions. And when do you call on God? In need. Just like Haggai, as you'll read on, you came for the wheat and, and, and there for 30 tares and there was only 20. You come for your resources, and, but you planted nothing. You don't have anything. Blight and mildew has taken over. 
mildew, but from neglect, blight, disease, corruption. That which is still there you thought was a resource is contaminated. It's no good, it's no use to you. And God's like, I want to have you plant those seeds in the fields again. I want to prosper your land again, but I have to be the center of your life again for that to happen. He said, be holy as I am holy. We can be holy, intimate, aiming for perfection, pursuing his perfection in our life. No longer apathetic or blind to the vision of what God has asked of us. Do not look as a follower to what the world says is okay or even those in the church would say is okay. Ask God what he says is okay for your life. I'm no longer satisfied in these things. Ecclesiastes 8.11 shows that man, because of God's long suffering or his delay, believes that they've gotten away with their actions. Too easily, when we see God's delay and long suffering, we think that he's condoning of our action. And so we just go further down that road. And that's why I said seasons change. Seasons come and go, but there's a time when that season ends and you are gonna be left without. That's a warning. It's a warning to the hearts of everybody that can hear my voice. The holiness of God, is, he needs direct entrance. He needs to be the center Lord of your life. I beg you to understand that. What he offers is a blessing and prosperity in return. There is no equal. It's fleeting what you can find in this world. You might find success by your own hand, but in the end, it just leads to corruption. It corrupts your very heart. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. According to Luke eleven thirteen, it brings pleasure to God to give the Holy Spirit to us. God doesn't ignore sin. He addresses it. God made a way for us through his spirit by the power of the spirit of Jesus Christ. This, he became sin who knew no sin. He didn't just take sin on, he became sin. It absorbed him in full and as a pure and spotless lamb for sacrifice, that blood covenant was honored. The sacrifice was made and it was fulfilled. And he offers you that spirit that by covenant has been fulfilled to live in and through you. Have you made a place worthy of the spirit of God to dwell? You can close your eyes, think with me, like go through this last week, your thoughts, your actions, what you spent your money on, the way you talked, the way you listened to other people. Is that a representation of a holy God? Is that a life that would honor him? These are convicting words because he deserves for us as a people. Like in Timothy, it says that we are like earthen clay vessels, some for discard and some for honor, some for dishonor, but you can choose. It says man has the ability to choose, to become a vessel of gold and silver for his goodwill and purpose. Don't make your life just that which is discarded as a, a vessel for dishonor, but rather exchange for that which is for the will of God. Purified, we choose. Lord, purify me, purge me. Purge my heart, God. Make clean. That's what we can do today. That's the beauty of his grace and mercy is that there's a place today where we can say, God, just purge me today. Purify my heart. See that there be any wicked way in me. Search me, oh God. These are the actions in the heart of man crying out to a God saying, God, you know best, show me. That's where we're at today. Our only kingdom contact is through the spirit of God. Jesus explained to Nicodemus, unless a man is born of the spirit, he will not see the kingdom of God. Holiness means there is a purity where we, what you say and what you do are the same thing. Purify us, purge us, Lord. Bring a purity to my thoughts, my motives, my heart. 
You ask, how is it possible? John 16, 13, when the spirit comes, he will teach you all things. All you have to do is listen. He is the one who gives us the internal instruction to change. God has instruction for your life. It begins through his spirit. This is within our soul. Our mind, will, and emotions can be submitted to God. How many of you have emotional fatigue? There is only victory in holiness. You will not experience God's victory without the holiness of God. You see, the victory is elevated to the place of his throne. You wanna see healing in your life? You wanna see holiness in your life? You wanna see the elevation of the victories of God in your life? Let the holiness of God fill your heart. You will find victory there because he will be there. I think our churches have become all too quick to try to seek the manifestation of what the spirit can do instead of conducting our life to allow the spirit to feel welcome. And it's time for us to kind of turn the, the accounts and say, God, I wanna seek your glory. But to seek your glory, Lord, that means I need to repent. Mm -hmm. I need to be purged. I need to be purified, mm -hmm. sanctified. So Lord, show me these are the areas of my life. I've struggled my life over to figure out how to conduct my motive and my thoughts to match my heart and my desire for the relationship with him. We stumble, we fall, we have hardships, but God's given us grace greater than he did in the Old Testament in a sense. Seems like that just to have brought about quick and sudden death. But where does that strength come from? It's not an external solution. Word of God, we read it in John 7. It's an internal solution. Read this, John 7, 38. Let me open to that. John 7, 38 says, I'll start in 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. From the inner man will flow rivers of living water. See, Ezekiel actually has this prophetic dream. And what does he see is the temple of God in his dream. And in that dream, he sees a trickle of water start to begin to flow from the, the throne of God. And it exits from the holy of holies and begins to fill the outer court and it, and it builds and that water becomes a river, and that river becomes a ocean. And Ezekiel goes deeper and deeper into that place, filled with the presence of God. But that is our Messiah. That is Christ Jesus. That is his spirit that flows into the flesh of all mankind that desires and gives room and residence for him. But from that, from us flows, from the inner side of us, from the inner heart of us as men, the glory of God flows for all mankind. You see, the spirit desires to flow in and through us. Be, a, be challenged today to be a vessel worthy of letting the presence of God flow through you. So where does that strength come from? It's, an ex, it's not an external solution. It's not coming down like rain from heaven. It is inside of us. It says, work outwardly your salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Everything that stands in the way, every flesh act that stands in the way, every thought that stands in the way, hold captive. Every emotion that, that draws fatigue, surrender it to God and let the peace of God that passes understanding guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And begin to allow the centrality of the spirit of God to begin to flow through you and be hidden in the sight of his glory so that all that others see is not you, but him in you. See, Christ hides in the glory of God and he comes out to mankind as Emmanuel as God with us in human form. And then he draws back into that cloud of glory as he ascends, back into the glory in his presence. You and I are, are fit for the same, where we can draw out of his glory and all they see is the image of Christ. You see, that's how the ministry is gonna begin. But here's a greater warning in Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Without it, you will not see the Lord. Without holiness, without peace, you will not see the Lord. Pursue it, pursue it with your heart. This is not a community club. This is not a ministry one to another. This is not a place for you to feel better about the life you're living, but you to give your life over to God so that he can begin to live through you. 
we have a holy calling to be set apart as a holy nation, set apart for a purpose. And I guarantee you, God has given a purpose to each and every one of you here. And it's time to purge our hearts and lives and to give it. Conclusion, without that, what? Without peace and holiness, we will not see Christ. We will not see God. We will not see the Lord. That doesn't get taught in church very often, does it? But we are a people that need to repent. Are you ready to just open your hearts with me? Let's just bow our hearts before the Lord, close our eyes before him. And I'm telling you, today is a day that we need to pursue him. We need to pursue him with a passion for he is holy. Our God is a holy God. Our God is a God that stands above all other gods, every idol. And he isn't God if you'd made him of your own fashioning and desire. He is holy, set apart. He is everything. Father God, today we just, we stand before you. Lord, usher into this place your presence. Lord, feel welcome here. Feel welcome here today, Lord. Our ministry, Lord, today begins with being the living sacrifice. The living sacrifice placed upon an altar to know your good, perfect will, Lord. Sanctify our hearts. Or what we have falls short. Our personal struggles even get in the way of your plan for us, Lord. So Lord, draw us near today. And the only way near is to repent and let go of the things of this world that stand in the way. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those thumbs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. And don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion.
but what we have, he asked for. He's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And no matter where your struggle is today, no matter what you're facing, we serve a God who can, whose will is for you, his heart is for you, his purposes are for you, and he hasn't given up on you. And it's just time to release, to let go and make a place for him. Holy, holy, holy Lord God place right here and now in your heart and begin to ask the Lord to show you to show you that place in your heart that should be belonging to him that you haven't surrendered yet every room make room for him we tend to have vacancies in our heart that easily get filled but it's a place that God alone deserves to fill Don't let resentment or bitterness fill your heart. We strive and we struggle just as Hebrews says, I haven't seen the affliction to blood and sweat and tears yet. You haven't given your life over. Your struggle isn't as real as you think that it can be. But let the Spirit of God overwhelm you now. See, we need to be immersed in the presence of God, immersed into the Spirit of God. We call down to you now, Spirit of God, would you acknowledge us with your glory today? The pastor once said, uh, when asked why the congregation didn't respond to the message, and he said, well, I had the same message down the street, and they responded just fine. But he said the difference was they were hungry. I think it's time to have a little bit of a hunger for the Lord and what the Lord has for us. Not just coming to fill time and see each other, but to pursue and see God. To see the Lord seated upon his throne, high and lifted up. And in our humility, to see the goodness of God and what he's done for us. So I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is holy. these moments just belong to and we need to learn to slow down all your emotional fatigue is because you haven't stopped running yet focus on the one who can fix it all to set your heart at ease to 
remove the worries and fears in your life. To fear in a wholesome way that God who is worthy of fear. The creator of all things. God, our ministry must first be to you as our priority. And even if we're in struggle, even if we lost hope, even if we've lost sight of you, Lord, your heart for us has always been available as a light before us which illuminates the path in which you have. So today, God, I ask that you would reveal to our hearts, to our lives, Lord, the goodness, the forgiveness, the grace that can only be found in you. And I pray that our souls would begin to cultivate the relationship that you deserve. And in the morning hours that we would begin to focus on your words that were for us as instructions for our life that we would begin to focus on the heart that you have for us and begin to worship you with all of our might and that we would begin to see your hand at work in harmony with your plans for us. And although some in this room by their fatigue and heart don't know where hope is found in their current life and situation, I'm telling you, focus on God. Focus on him. Let him make straight the path before you. So with that, I just pray a blessing over everyone that's here today. It's inexcusable the way we live our life, knowing there is a God who has created all things who deserves our praise, our life in honor as service. And there is nothing you can do to earn his love, for his love far exceeds 
any requirement that you could ever make. But Christ did it for you and for me. So we thank him for that. And in that we say, amen. amen. All right. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 If you need prayer, do not leave this place without seeking for those that love you. And we'll give counsel and pray with you. But we love you. We look forward to seeing you next week. So many things. Look in the newsletter and make sure you're kept up to date. And I'll see all you youth tomorrow. We're going to go bowling.